I wonder how flammable ramen is. Maybe that's why the ramen shop went up in flames. He maybe he they used to very they were experimenting with uh, you know quantum atom level ramen. <laughs> wow. Hello and welcome to the Abroad in Japan podcast. Probably the best way of learning about life in Japan without actually being in Japan. I'm your host, Chris Broad, and we're joined as always by England's top Japan enthusiast, Mr. Pete Dawson himself. Pete, how the devil are you doing? What's going on? I'm good, Chris. I say good. I am full of calls. There's going to be a lot of muting and mucusing <laughs> this morning, I'm afraid. Um, I am off my head on uh, pseudephedrine. But why can't I have the real ephedrine? That's the, that's the point, <laughs> the old pseudophed. Why can't I have the real real stuff? I don't even know what ephedrine is. It sounds like it comes out of your body. It sounds like the sort of thing you, your body makes when it's, when it's scared. Is that right? Oh, I, I don't know, but I'm, I do miss like all the easily accessible British drugs. You know, in Japan, like, it's quite hard to buy... Like anything, the the pharmaceutical right. stores are like separate from like everything else. It'd be so good mm. to walk into a convenience store, get whatever drugs you need, and walk off. But here they have to be like sold in a separate kind of store, and it's kind of annoying. Oh, uh, like, it's like simple painkillers, like you know ibuprofen or whatever. You have to go to like a, a pharmacy. You can't just walk into Lawson right. and, and get what you want. I don't know why that is. Kind of yeah, you'd think that Lawson, being twenty four hours, could sell the, the mm. um, kind of slightly lamer uh, end of, of end of things. I thought they did sell tablets. I, I would say that it's um, <clears throat> it's a little easier than uh, working uh, how it all works in uh, America. Uh, if you go into Walgreens or you go into uh, what are the other big um, pharmacies out there? Walgreens. Well, let's go with Walgreens. If you buy anything um, in that shop, you have mm. to um, press a button. Uh, on the display, and a man or a woman has to, or anyone has to come over and uh, and give me uh, the, the the things that I want out of the cabinet because they will treat everyone as if they're criminals. <laughs> and you can also buy like a bucket of pills in America. Oh, I'm amazing! Amazing. Yeah. If I if if I go and pick up some uh, some uh, Tom Tom tablets, uh, I absolutely load up before I go <laughs> home because like the the servings are. Very American. <laughs> There's like 300 tablets in one bag. It's absolutely brilliant. It sounds like you treat them as sweets, Pete. There's like simple Just pop them. Well, and antacids, I certainly do. Yeah, good, good God. <laughs> but I mean, the the thing about uh, pseudephedrine uh, is that um, I don't think you even buy it in America because um, I believe you can make it uh, make a crank out of it. So uh, that's why they don't sell it. So God bless the uh, <laughs> Brit, the good old British Donald Trump's a fan. The good old European pseudophed. <laughs> it's really getting me through this show. I could certainly do with some drugs myself today. I just uh, yesterday I did a Spartan race for the first time in a year. Oh, and lordy, did, Chris! I'm aching like mm. so bad, and and also there's a time delay between like working out and the pain. Often you always find there's like a twelve to twenty four hour delay. Like I finished the yeah. race about twenty four hours ago, and only now am I sort of struggling to stand up and, and yeah. do the simplest of tasks. But it was a sort of mixed bag yesterday. It was the first Spartan race I failed uh, ever. Will, mm. Which I kind of I only slept four hours the night before, which you that's not ideal. Do. Yeah, I knew I was stuffed when I just couldn't sleep. Um, had four mm. hours of sleep, and the first actually the first sort of seventy percent it went all right. I actually did all the obstacles, no problems, and then I just felt like every all the energy just went from me. I just felt drained, you know, like your Toyota right. Century car battery. <laughs> Drained, drained of energy. Don't have a go. Don't lash out because you failed your bloody, your bloody run. Um, I, w- I would say that uh, uh, in many ways, because I've never done any kind of race, any kind of uh, Spartan race, um, it, for me, it's very much Sch- Schrodinger's Spartan race. Shredding. Maybe I'd finish it, maybe I wouldn't. But I'll never know because I'll never try, Chris. <laughs> we, you should do it. Come over. Come over here. We'll do Come over here. Spartan do a Spartan race. race. Yeah, yeah, you brilliant. can do them in the UK. They're everywhere as well. But yeah, it was, it was unfortunate. I basically, I did like... Uh, three exercises back to back I did the one that I've there's one I always fail that I just give up on I don't do it at all I just do the burpees when you right. fail uh, one of the 20 obstacles in a Spartan race you have to do like 20 to 30 burpees and um, oh it's like a fine it's, nice it's okay. fucking horrible what's um, the thing you can't do or refuse to do so this was monkey bars there's like two or three right. monkey bar ones and I just go no no I'll just do burpees no. at this time yeah. I was like I'm gonna do it and I tried and I, I actually got like 80% across and the whole right. of the race was cheering me on. Nobody could believe it. There was, you know, it was like Connor and Nick and Andrew, and they're all screaming and cheering and I was nearly there and then I just like, no, and I just let go and smash into the ground and uh, it was very anticlimactic, but I was kind of so proud. This is all... I made it, nearly, nearly made it to the other side when I've never so got this is all. Place. So this is all being filmed by Connor and people. This is all being, this is all going somewhere. 
you can I mean you can watch that uh, Connor's editor a guy called Mudam really cool guy from mm. Estonia who uh, edits Trash Taste he's doing daily right. vlogs at the moment and he okay. did post a lot of the Spartan race uh, he's already posted it he's a mega mega super speed editor he's a he mega uploader 12 hours <laughs> uh, what takes us normally 12 months but um, yeah and after that I, I just I did a few other things I just felt devoid of energy and I had to sort of give up I actually bailed on the last four obstacles and I didn't run through the finish line because I felt like I, I didn't deserve it. Oh. And, uh, do you, do yeah, you, yeah, I, I get the sense that you're a little bit um, emotionally fragile about the whole thing. <laughs> I just, I, because you realise... Like because you can the fish just... and chip shop got crashed into by a go-kart. It's <laughs> exactly. Do you not think that like you could just do a normal race? Why do you always have to go Spartan? What is this obsession with this collection of people? Oh, I know, right? It was a shame. I got so far and I ran five kilometres. And... Mm. But yeah, no, I just, I, I, I knew when, I, when to say no, really. I think if I'd carried on, right. I would have been leaving in an ambulance, a very slow ambulance, as we've established in Japan. <laughs> they don't drive fast, do they? <laughs> so, oh, yeah, I've no, but I've no shame in it in the sense that I, I didn't sleep at all, and you, when you're doing mm. a race, you really need a good night's sleep the night before, yeah. so you're well rested. And uh, yeah, I, I felt it big time. But uh, I'll do it again. I'll do it, and I've done it twice already, and I'm pretty yeah. happy with the last two attempts I've done, including the first one which I filmed, which we it was the the really difficult, the hardest one in like Japan, which I'm really proud mm. of. So yeah, I'll do it again. God damn it, I'll never give up. I'll get do it on you, Chris. Race. Get on those monkey bars. Like, what monkey we need bars. is a, a rocky montage of you training <laughs> on the old monkey bars. I mean, it's a, apart from everything else, like all of the other um, skills in the old Spartan race are presumably mm. quite, I mean, ground centric and all about legs. And then suddenly you get this mm. one that's monkey bars. You're like, I, I would be quite, I would find that quite difficult to be honest. It's just, it was just tough to like physically hold up all your body weight, especially when you're yeah. me. You know, I've got eighty five kilograms to hold up somehow. Yeah, uh, lots of energy jelly on your back as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, like, I was amazed I made, managed to get that. It was kind of frustrating. I was like two poles, two monkey bars from the finish line, and it would have been ah. the icing on the, the cake. But I can't have my cake and eat it. I will do it again, and next time I'll finish those monkey bars. Because I am. I think I'm currently the fittest I've been in many years, thanks to the mm. cycle. So, yeah, I'm down for doing it again. And uh, Good on you. Yeah. Good fun. We got a story this week from Marcus from Vienna, who says, Hello, Chris and Pete. I'm travelling in Japan and decided to complete the Shimanami Kaido cycle with a friend. We emailed our hotel ahead of time, asking to send our luggage to our next hotel. I'll just, for those who don't know, Shimanami Kaido is like a big cycle over the inland sea of Japan, about 100 mm. kilometres. Amazing thing. Um, we emailed our hotel ahead of time, asking to send our luggage to our next hotel. They couldn't guarantee it would arrive on time, so we decided to travel light, Spartan style. Stay one <laughs> night elsewhere and then return for a quick refresh before travelling onwards to Tokyo. On the morning of departure, we filled out some paperwork for the hotel to keep our bags overnight. It seemed pretty thorough, but we thought nothing of it and went on to enjoy our ride through the glorious islands of the Inland Sea. When we returned the next day, exhausted, the hotel staff... Staff seemed confused and said our luggage wasn't there. After some frantic Google translating, they found our original email about sending the luggage to Imabari and it seemed that the cases had indeed been shipped forward, albeit a day late. One of the staff realised the mistake, grabbed the luggage papers and said, please wait three hours. He then jumped into his car and sped off. Long story short, he drove to Imabari and fetched our luggage and brought it all the way back. Fucking hell. I've never experienced <laughs> such dedicated customer service. His act of kindness averted a possible horror story of massive delays and we were so grateful. What's been your best experience of Japanese service and or support? Best regards, Marcus from Vienna. Bloody hell, that's that's insane. Three hour drive. Can you imagine like a British member of staff doing that at any business, going out their way for three hours? Uh, I'm no. sorry, but if I, if I worked in a hotel and had access to a car, that is the first thing I would offer. <laughs> it's like, can I get out of here for three hours? Actually, yes, yeah. please. <laughs> Stick some tunes like on. That. Thank you very much. I mean, the, the, the Japanese, I mean, we've spoken about it before, they are always quite overstaffed. Um, but hotels mm. never look overstaffed, I would say. So um, good good on Marcus from Vienna's uh, chosen hotel uh, for going the extra mile, the extra hundreds of miles, I imagine. Yeah, the way you've just reframed it does make it seem like a little holiday, doesn't it? Like, a little holiday. Uh, drive three hours across the most beautiful yeah. part of Japan listening to Hall and Oates. I'll do it. I'll take one for the team. Listening yeah. to some yacht rock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair point. People, uh, you know, people, uh, the luggage forwarding thing, that was a concept I didn't really comprehend <clears> until I got to Japan. Because, <throat> again, I don't know 
if that exists in the UK, the idea of just mm. sending your luggage into the abyss. Uh, mm. Wouldn't and, wouldn't trust it. Going to Heathrow Airport, as it's called. I, you know, I, I, but like, yeah, you can forward your luggage in Japan. It's pretty cool. You just rock up at a hotel, say, I want to go there. And yeah. sometimes it turns up. It's great. Um, <laughs> did, you, did you see the story? That we haven't, funnily enough, it's not in this week's news story, but there was an article where Japan was ranked the least friendly country in the world or something. Did you see right. that? Um, no, I didn't. We'll I dig mean... into it in an upcoming episode. But mm. um, yeah, there was an article that was like, Japan is the least friendly country in the world for helping strangers. Even though one in three Abroad in Japan podcast episodes are like the kindness of strangers. Even, even at, on an anecdotal level with this podcast email, like it's every second email, people are going, and, yeah. somebody gave the deeds to, to their house to me to, to, <laughs> to, to apologise for stepping on their shoe. Like, I'm sorry, that <laughs> that you can, you can level a lot of horrific and true stuff uh, at, at how Japan uh, treats its people and its tourists, but mm. uh, that is, that, that's certainly not the aspect that I would um, focus on. That's, uh, yeah, and I'm, so I'm confused, like, why this is the result. And, um, yeah, there's, mm. some, there's some definite reasons and cultural reasons underpinning that. But we'll get to that in a, a future episode. Yeah. It's quite interesting. It's quite a, a nice little cultural deep dive. We don't have that this week, though. We've got a story about a ramen shop that caught fire, but the people, the people kept on eating. Mm. Tate, tell us about this dying... This, this, Dying for some good ramen. What's going on in Shinjuku this week? It's, it's an all-night ramen party, Chris. You can't stop the ramen coming. Um, ramen, is it Ramen Jiro? Ramen Jiro, ramen Jiro yeah, yeah. Ramen Jiro uh, is a chain of restaurants known for its very dedicated fan base. So dedicated uh, that uh, some customers continue to eat their ramen instead of immediately evacuating when a fire broke out at Kabukicho at their branch there in uh, late May. Ramen uh, Jiro is said to be very unique uh, in that it doesn't even classify itself as ramen. Um, the, the 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 piece um, I, I don't know what um, I don't know which person uh, wrote this, but um, they basically say that very much like a New York slice is like uh, one kind of ramen, but ramen Jiro is a Chicago deep dish pizza, which is a, a lovely analogy. The portions are massive, mm. the fans love it, and they will not be rushed into finishing their ramen and. Um, <laughs> Basically, somebody called Jeffrey J. Hall has posted a picture uh, of uh, a fire and dark plumes of smoke uh, darkening uh, the screen in this uh, video. Uh, however, through the thick smoke, you can see several people still eating their ramen, sitting on their stools in the middle of f flaming, uh, you know, smoke billowing through their ramen restaurant. Um, and that you can hear sirens in the background. The fire the engines image, are it? in attendance. It's amazing. This, this uh, you know, it's it's the, it's the, this is fine dog. It's that this is this is ramen dog. <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> it's absolutely awesome. Um, but it's. Um, you know, in Japan, we're sort of told that uh, the Japanese um, follow rules and regulations and they're very risk averse. But not these ramen lovers. They are absolutely <laughs> chowing down on that ramen. I would say that, I, I mean, it's a wet um, meal. So, you know, <laughs> Use you the could ramen stick. To put the fire out. Exactly. Very stick oily, the ball on your head. Stick the ball on yeah. your head and maintain, maintain moisture. <laughs> oh, God. I wonder, if the, I wonder how flammable ramen is. Maybe that's why the ramen shop went up in flames. Who. Maybe they used very. They were experimenting with, uh, you know, quantum mm. or, uh, atom level ramen. <laughs> but Jiro, Jiro ramen. I only found out what this was a few years ago. Right, it's a kind of distinct type of ramen where uh, it has uh, an awful lot of bean sprouts on it. We're talking like a gallon of bean sprouts stuck <laughs> on the top, just over here. The, uh, this is an awful amount of bean sprouts. <laughs> well, like here's this this ramen in the studio. If you're watching on YouTube, you know there's a little mm. bit of bean sprouts on there. Ramen jiro is yeah. like ten times that portion. It is a heap. Right, it is a pile. Oh no, my pork just fell off onto the floor. I'll get that later. And uh, <laughs> it's ramen that's aimed at sort of uh, you know students who don't have that much money but want to have a big hearty filling meal on a budget kind of thing. And you can like. There's one in Sendai, and the queue was always formidable. There was a queue day and night uh, out the front because people will go mad for this stuff. And when you get in, actually, you're supposed to eat it often within like eight minutes. You have to get in, eat the ramen. Right. You sort of you sort of go in as a group. Um, so right. they take like ten people in the queue, bring them in. They have to eat the ramen in ten minutes. You're not allowed to really speak or chat or talk. Uh, right. And then you have to essentially fuck off and get thrown out very quickly. And then the next group come in. And if you do start 
talking or dicking about or taking photos, the staff will often like berate you and be like, can you, wow. can you just eat the ramen? Because it's the idea, right? <laughs> no. <It's> <laughs> cheap mass market ramen where the profit right. margins are probably nothing. So they have to have loads of people. They have to have quite well, a lot of footfall. Right? I imagine they're losing a bit of money off the top on the, on the old bean sprouts. Maybe they're just trying to kick people out in eight minutes because um, if you eat a lot of bean sprouts, you do <laughs> do little Tommy, Tommy blow-offs, don't you? <laughs> Destroy them. Oh, before God. they start. Get them out before they start. <laughs> <laughs> I've, only been, well, I've only been there once and I didn't really enjoy the experience because I like to not down my ramen like a drinking shot. You know, you don't want to like, that fucking don't treat ramen like a shot of vodka. You've got to enjoy it, yeah. you've got to savour it. And you just yeah. can't in a Jiro ramen store. But I do get the appeal, you know, I get the appeal of just having a really hearty meal for like 500 yen. The price is yeah. really low. You know, we're talking like two or three dollars for mm. uh, soup, pork, noodles, and uh, quite thick pork broth in there as well. And awesome. a mountain of bean sprouts, so I get the yeah. appeal. I don't know what started the fire there. I don't really cover the fire, but it's quite a striking image, like this this ramen shop in Shinjuku, where it's eighty percent smoke, and <laughs> yet you can just see people just like quietly slurping needles in the frame <laughs> of the shop. It was always burning since the since the ramen was turning, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but yeah, I mean it's it's a funny old thing. I hope hopefully Juno will be remaining intact there in Shinjuku. Hopefully the the students yeah. will have their ramen. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I recommend trying it once. But I don't I don't really I don't really rate it that highly. It's not my thing. No, but, no. Um, and also I didn't know it was a it's a sort of franchise as well. They're all over, all around the country. They're all around the country. Mm. If you so want to go to Ramen Jiro and have a big flavourless bowl of ramen filled with mostly bean sprouts. We'll be back in just a moment, Step guys. In. With your stories, comments and questions in the fax machine. Wow. And we're back and we got a story from Ekaterina from Germany, haven't we, Pete? Over to you, mate. We have. Hello, Ekaterina. Uh, hello, Crispy Chris and lovable Pete. I've just returned from my first trip to Japan and South Korea, and the one thing that's been on my mind is the languages. The Koreans are proud of their simple writing system, Hangul, which was uh, designed specifically for Korean. It was created to replace the complex kanji, ka- kanji characters that don't fit Korean speech well. Hangul is a alphabet that anyone can learn to read in just a few hours. I appreciate the Japanese language with its three writing systems and extensive use of kanji. However, uh, are there any discussions uh, in Japan about simplifying their writing systems to make them more user friendly <laughs> please continue your fantastic work Katarina from Germany is um, Chris is the uh, writing were the writing systems kind of modified in like the 50s or something uh, I don't know actually possibly mm-hmm. possibly I don't know when don't Katakana know came into existence because obviously mm. Katakana's focus on uh, like the foreign foreign imported words and things like that yeah yeah um, Let's it might be like up, the Romaji please. writing system maybe got modified then. I think how to how to display um, Japanese in, in English, I would say. Mm. Or with, with says, Roman language. Katakana was developed in the 9th century oh, in order okay. to right. transliterate texts and works of art from India by taking and some yeah. things and some bits and pieces. But, but yeah, yeah, basically 9th century. So I don't know hmm. if they did change much recently. And I don't believe there's any appetite to change the language or the, the mm. writing system. Um, I sometimes wonder, I only realised the other day, the reason, you know, you know we always talk about how Japanese software is always so far behind, right? And even mm. to this day, websites here look like they were made in 1996. Yeah. Uh, one of the reasons Japan was slow to adopt software and one of the reasons it wasn't able to keep up its hardware lead and you know that it had in the 80s and 90s is because I think... Uh, most most computers back in the day, back in the eighties and nineties, were written in English, mm. and coding in Japanese was really hard to do, given yes. all the characters and all the language. And yeah. I never thought of that. I never realised that was the reason that Japan was a bit behind, like a, almost like a generation behind compared to the West when it came to yeah. software and computing. In some respects, um, but yeah, How do, I wonder. I mean, I guess it all sort of ends up in like assembly language, uh, your knots and your ones and stuff. But yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Surely it would be quicker to, uh, to, to like to code in Japanese into a system. I don't really know, to be honest. Maybe you could have like kanji just for computer routines, <laughs> just just kanji <laughs> that do that. They look cool. Well, they did use uh, kanji in the Matrix, didn't they, on the coding system? If you look at the, uh, right, the coding right. in the Matrix, it's just kanji characters like reversed, <laughs> like done upside <laughs> down and things. So it looks like it won in the future I love- anyway. 
I love seeing um, kind of uh, kanji written in very low resolution fonts, mm. low re- resolution typefaces um, on old computer screens. The, um, the the car I have been painfully uh, detailing uh, about about importing. Um, it's got this weird kind of like little option on the remote. It's got remote control on the back, yeah. and um, I don't know what I did, but every now and again, it'll tell me about a shrine. <laughs> <laughs> the, the front screen will just give me two pages on a shrine, and I, and I don't know what I've done. There's like this kind of um, this kind of beautiful kind of like in Carter esque kind of um, CD ROM map of Japan, and oh, you wow. can kind of uh, you can kind of move around Japan and, and 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 look at different kind of tourist spots as they were 25 Ooh. years ago. Let's make that very clear. But um, it's quite adorably done, and uh, yeah. But in the front, it, it you don't get to see any of that. You just get to see a, a couple of uh, pages of text going why do you go to this shrine I was going because I'm miles away I'm in South End <laughs> I never asked how did the car smell when he got it given it's like 20 fags old? it smelled really? of tabs little Timmy tabs um, and I've only just got the smell out it was a oh. yeah it was an arduous journey of uh, of constant uh, uh, chemical bombing and uh, <laughs> yeah chemical warfare and uh, just just uh, lots and lots of uh, trips to the um, people who, who are better at cleaning a car than I am so yeah it's um it's 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 really uh it, it really it smell, smell of tabs but uh, now it smells okay God. now it smells of bean sprouts because <laughs> like those cars in japan a lot of the old style taxis use uh, like the toyota century i think and uh yeah they smell very bad they smell like 30 yeah. years of cigarettes and it's brutal, it's brutal. <laughs> well it was like yeah. underneath the uh underneath the one of the uh, ashtrays mm. uh, i think there was like an overspill of the ash and i was oh. thinking god that ash like came out of someone's cigarette in uh, in uh, Kitakushu. Okay, no, it's a uh, uh, Beppu. I think the car comes from. <laughs> in, in a on a hot on a hot day in uh, in two thousand and one, uh, a man smoking a cigarette. I don't know why I chose two thousand and one. Obviously, when a you, big event. When you inhale Maybe he was watching it at the time. When you inhale it, you're inhaling culture. Really? Exactly. History. When I'm History. when I'm when I'm snorting big lines of it that I've uh, laid out on the dashboard. <laughs> I'm, oh, I'm inhaling God. history. Oh, I hate those cars. God, they make me so nauseous. Hello, crispy, fanny, chicky, Chris, and pocky, pocky, Pete. I'm a doctor oh. working in the UA, UK, NHS. <laughs> That's such a like whimsical line. And then I, I'm a serious. I have a serious job. Uh, and I used to live in Yokohama as a child. I adore the country, but and probably not the ideal question for two. Happily tied down men. I wonder what it's like to online date in Japan. Do you know how it's regarded if the apps are the same as they are here in the UK? And if you have friends um, that experience using them, the dating culture seems very difficult over there. So I'm intrigued to know if you have any stories from friends or times before you found your partners that you can share. Thank you for all the quality content and hard work you both put in. Holly from Rainy Surrey. Very good. Well, good Dr. Question. Holly, how exciting. I don't remember that app, the um, the app that came out a few months ago, where the Japanese, the the Tokyo government said that they were going to like make an app especially for like oh, dating. Yes. Yeah, people were like had mixed feelings on it. Like a government sponsored dating app, a radical, <laughs> a radical measure. Um, we'll wait and see how that turns out. But Small I mean, they have Tinder. <laughs> they have Tinder. Like I had yeah. friends that would come to Tokyo and use shamelessly use Tinder to hook up or meet interesting folks. Um, I don't really know that many people that use dating apps here, though. Um, there, I can't remember what the biggest Japanese dating app is because I've never used it. But right. there are a lot of Japan-centric apps, right? So things like Tinder aren't really widely used here. They're mainly for like foreign folks or uh, you know Japanese folks that want to meet foreigners, I think. But right. there's um, yeah, there is a whole genre of Japanese-specific dating apps. Um, let me look them up. I think it's kind of like um, I, I think from not my experience, but certainly may to have gone out. That it's I think we have a perception in the West that it's all about dating on the old uh, Tinder, but out in Japan, it's very much um, wanting to hang out with people mm. who speak English. You know, cutting your cutting your English uh, language teeth um, nice and easy. I think stuff like that's um, kind of quite common. People just use it for that. Well, apparently the biggest one, of the most the good one's Bumble, which is obviously quite well, well mm. known outside Japan. Right. Pairs, OK Cupid, but yeah, I have no really good stories there, unfortunately. Um, 
Yeah, I've got nothing I can add, Holly. Um, although they, I do they know... named they they named it Bumble, but not really thinking about the Japanese market because Bumble. that's a hard word to say. <laughs> Bum Bumburu. Yeah, Bumburu. <laughs> I met him on Bumburu. Did you? <laughs> Good. <laughs> that sounds like a fetish site. <laughs> oh God. I do know uh, good friends who met through OK Cupid, and they're married and happy, and that worked out nicely. So, yeah, OK Cupid seems to be a good one if you if you're taking it seriously, but. Um, yeah, in a recent survey of 20 to 40-year-olds in Japan, 80% of unmarried men and women said they wanted a relationship, whether it be a marriage partner, serious relationship, or casual fling. While a minority oh. of those in the aforementioned survey said they had concerns about dating apps, 17% said they wouldn't use one at all. So there you go. Bit of a lot of affairs there. out there. Just exactly. saying. <laughs> <laughs> go on, to be accepted. Scott. Scott says, Ellie, Chris, Peter, got the chance to study abroad this June, July in Japan, mainly in Kyoto. I was hoping that I'd still be able to enjoy the games with fellow England supporters, but I was unsure if there'd be anyone else watching the Euros with me at the local pubs or bars. If I go out to watch the games late at night, will there be many people watching with me or should I just watch the games in my hotel room? Thank you, Scott. There's definitely, yeah, there is actually quite a lot of British pub chains like Hub and Pig and Whistle and all sorts that mm. they do watch sports like hub do watch uh you know sports and whatnot so yeah that'd be and they're all best, and, and like this show the uh the matches may start at one o'clock but there's still people kicking around watching them yeah if you if your jet lag can handle it there's usually near every like major train station in japan there's either a hub or like an irish mm. pub chain or yeah. anything so like yeah then there's a there's a i've recently filming one called footnik in osaki down in, here in tokyo and uh my god the fish and chips were an atrocity. I was disgusting. <laughs> I was really, oh, I was so disappointed. But they had Magnus Cider, and that's a rare thing to find in Tokyo. So they kind of made up for it. But the batter, Magnus Cider, out of all of the ciders, such an interesting it's a good, one to it's go a good, for. It's, it's a good, the good. Oh, the, the batter though. The batter you needed like a fucking pickaxe to get through it, and the fish <laughs> was like, it was just slimy. No, it was horrible. It was horrible. Oh dear. God, be careful where you get your fish and chips in Japan. Keep the stories, comments, questions coming in to a Born Japan podcast at gmail.com or type away down here on YouTube. But for now, guys, have yourself a great few days. We'll see you right back here to do it all over again on the Abroad Japan podcast. Bye for now. Bye. <laughs>